This is the Roman Catholic convent of the poor Clares in Arundel. Here, 21 nuns live in prayer and contemplation. Their way of life has remained largely unchanged for hundreds of years, until now. One bohemian atheist. Bollocks, piss off. A disillusioned workaholic. A mother of three who is terrified of God. Couldn't he do it in a less scary way? And a soul singing reformed alcoholic are moving in. All at crisis point, they are leaving behind everything they know and love to spend 40 days and 40 nights on a quest to find meaning in their lives. But not even the nuns could expect the road to salvation to be quite so rocky. They were behaving a little bit like bolshie teenagers. I think it is actually a form of abuse. Yes, I won't work with it. It's a bit like Catholic boot camp. No matter how hard they fight against it. I really do think it's going to help me a lot if I can just get over my fear of things, which I'm really working on. This journey could ultimately change their lives forever. God, what am I going to do when it comes time to go? Previously on The Convent... What we'd like to encourage you to do is to keep the silence. To do Adapting to the nun's way of life has not been easy for the four guests. I don't know what you've been doing upstairs in that little dormitory of yours up there, but we don't go into each other's rooms. And it would be terrible if we failed in our sort of commitment to you by not saying something to you quite firmly, that if you don't take the opportunity, you're, you're going to lose. Most at odds with the regime is Victoria. Aren't you baptised? No, of course not. Brought up an atheist. Not likely to have been baptised. Well, you right? <laughs> no. It's like there's no space for us to question this at all. None. We have to go to the prayers. We have to do everything. We have to do it. Da 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 da. Married, but in a three way relationship, Victoria came here keen to experience life with boundaries, but has spent most of her time breaking them. Her main focus in the convent seems to be her new best friend, competitive businesswoman, Angela. It's like you want to understand the Bible better than the nuns do. <laughs> you're really frustrated that you're not top of the class. <laughs> Angela came to the convent aware something was missing in her life. She's used to getting results and has been frustrated by her lack of spiritual growth. Oh, I haven't found God yet. Been here two weeks. Or... I'm not a better person and I've been here two weeks and I don't know what I'm going to do when I come out of here and I should have got that done in, in the first two weeks. <laughs> I think that's it. most things in my life, if, if you want them, yes. you can find a way to get them if you work hard enough or you go in the right direction. Whereas, Whereas with this you can't. No, because it's a free gift. Yeah. Even the one guest with a confirmed faith has found convent life a challenge. 25-year-old soul singer Iona came here looking for an answer to a simple question how to live life as a celibate. But more fundamental issues of discipline have begun to emerge for this evangelical Christian. I'm not sure how I'm going to do it all, I think. I don't know how this discipline and patience is going to come. <laughs> for the last guest, convent life has proved more palatable, but the spiritual journey has been disturbing. You weren't crying, were you? Oh, my God. <laughs> oh, my I cry everything. I cry if I lie to me flipping tights. I just cry all over the place. Mother of three Debbie arrived here in fear of God. Abandoned by her mother as a child, convent life has been helping her overcome fears of rejection and low self-esteem. God is love. <sighs> You've had enough punishment in your life for a dozen people. He wants you to learn that you must love. The nuns agreed to open their doors in order to share their age-old values with the outside world. But by the end of the second week, an event from the outside world threatens to destabilize the experiment. Simon, the third person in Victoria's open marriage, has lost his father. After much deliberation, 
she has decided to leave the enclosure to be with him while he grieves. As the experience becomes increasingly intense for the other guests, Victoria's sudden departure and uncertainty over her return has had a huge impact. Twenty days left to go, and life in the convent carries on without Victoria. Everyone within the enclosure has been affected by her departure, but most of all her new friend, Angela. I think maybe Angela's less distracted. Maybe in not focusing her energies on on on, a, on Vic's perceived need, um, but probably actually, it's Angela's need to uh, to think that Vic needs help and will distract herself in that rather than dealing with what's going on inside. Like you might, anyway. You've got. So eager was she to add a spiritual dimension to her life, Angela sacrificed her six-figure salary job to come here. But the nun's all-consuming relationship with God remains a mystery to her, and her frustration is growing. But I thought if I gave you a small one each yeah. <laughs> to do your image of God. Mm. I can't believe it that we actually come and do candles, and even when we're making candles, we're, we're finding some way of bringing it round to God. And right. why is it that we can't recreate about it, eh? Why not? Don't know. Why can't it be fun and enjoyable and I nice? I love her. Eh? Great. Why not? It should be. That's good. I mean, I'm interested to hear that's what you're saying. For somebody who's not a nun or, or very involved in religious life, mm -hmm. you perceive that not everything that you do is totally about, well, how do you see that in God's eyes or whatever? You know, like if I was at work, I wouldn't be thinking, well, when I write this report, you know, or whatever, how is it in God's eyes? So it's an unusual concept for me to well, get my head round. Yes, but I suppose... So if I sound disrespectful to you, then you that's... Didn't, I didn't say that. I'm not doing very well today, am I? No, do you want to fade no, out? No, 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 shut no, 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 She's only not. Because, like, I suppose if one's given one's life to God, and this mm -hmm. is my life, mm. then I'm not going to spend my life being miserable or thinking that it's all serious. Just, it's the eyes through which you look at life, I think. Um, yeah. A string of failed relationships has left Angela reluctant to have faith in anything that's outside her control. But with the encouragement given by Sister Gabriel in their private mentor sessions, she's beginning to open up about her past. It's difficult because I have been let down yeah. a lot of times or mm. yeah. left people a lot of times myself because I've just felt that it wasn't right. So, you know, it's how many times you can keep Trust. trusting and letting yourself do that, you know? Yeah. yeah. And then the issue I have with on a parallel line to that in respect of having faith in God is because, again, I'm always determined to look after myself because mm. otherwise mm. you get let down. It's hard, Angela, because you've got to trust. Mm. I mean, we can't show you any other way than by the way that we live. And all that we can do is invite you to do that. Mm. Um, and to sit with us in our prayer time, because sometimes you've just got to sit with the, the silence and the nothingness and the non-productiveness and the no fruit and the no matter how hard I try, however how hard I work, sometimes there's still nothing. Mm. Um, and that's terribly hard, I think, especially for somebody like you who is used to doing things mm. and having a certain order and then at the end you get a product. Mm. And, and our life isn't like that. Um, it's like an abandonment, Angela. Mm. Do you see what I'm... Like you're abandoning yourself. That's the big risk, cos all the walls come down. And if you do that, it makes you really vulnerable and people can hurt you. And because it's happened before and because you've been hurt, it's completely natural not to want to do that again. Mm. But ultimately, you see, Angela, 
God mm. never lets us down. Mm. The following day, and the routine of convent life continues for the three remaining guests. For three weeks, they've all tried to follow the nuns' rigorous regime of 5 a.m. starts, seven services a day, and long bouts of silence. But the contemplative life is beginning to churn up deep and unsettling emotions. The nuns see this as a positive step towards self-knowledge and feel there are real gains to be had if the woman can work through this difficult time. But there is a distraction for Angela. Her best friend has just arrived back. All right. Great. Victoria quietly All right. returns to convent life. Mm. Right, while everyone else is in the chapel. Gifts to go. <laughs> Before she left, she was beginning to work through issues of her own selfishness and think about its impact on others. Can't believe I've come back. <laughs> It felt really weird being out, actually. It was really noisy. <laughs> the world's very noisy. And it was quite difficult as well, you know. And some... But it was lovely as well. It's good to see them both, see that they're well. <laughs> Adam told me yesterday, after about an hour, he said, you know, you're not allowed to say sorry once more about anything. <laughs> it was apparently I've developed a habit of apologising for myself and who I am and how I am. And he was like, wow, <laughs> it's working then, <laughs> suddenly. The, the, uh, the guilt. Victoria's choice to leave her two men and return suggests convent life is working for her. But even here, she chooses to please herself. Angela has come down to help her bring up the last of her belongings. One shopping bag of chocolates and bath oils, and six bottles of wine. Poor Claire Nunn share all that is given to them. Secret stash. So this kind of hoarding would be considered decidedly unsisterly. I can't believe you bought this much. Sweet. We're just going out. Just the, there's the bell rings. The bell. I can't go the, in bell is away. Away. the community is pleased that Victoria has returned to the convent, even if it is on her own terms. Poor Claire nuns know they can only guide their guests. How far the woman travel is up to them. Yeah. They're frightened. Because they, they like to be in control, you see. Um, and you see, what we actually give up is our control over our lives. And that helps you to live in a more completely surrendered state of being. You surrender yourself through obedience. And it's not easy. It isn't, it's never, it does, it's because you choose to do it and because you take a vow to do it. It doesn't actually stop you wanting your own way. But because you choose to do it, you gain something from it. And if they could do that wholeheartedly, that they might well come to a, a better sort of understanding as a result of yielding themself, themselves more completely. The values underpinning the rigor and ritual of convent life are beginning to affect the women. 
The Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know how to pray as we ought. But the Spirit Mother of three Debbie diligently follows the nun's routine and finds comfort and security in their way of life. This is helping her deal with her issues of being abandoned by her mother when she was a child. I'm not angry at her because she was the way she was and she made the decisions mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. there are circumstances that you have to leave your children like me. Mm -hmm. I've had to leave mm -hmm. Jamie. Mm -hmm. um, Helping her work through these deep-seated problems is Sister Claire Agnes. I don't know where to put the pain of everyday rejection. Mm -hmm. I don't know where to slot that in, in my life. Mm. OK, you're living the, this daily rejection, but you're not living it as the adult that you are. You are living it as the child that experienced it before. You've got to look forward in hope that you're not going to be in this pathetic state and tied up with this child in which you're living in your adult life. You are an adult. And it's your adult that's got to address this particular problem, not the child. And you've got to, to, to comfort this child. You've got, you know how you mother Jamie? Yeah. You've got to mother your inner wounded child. Love is the most healing thing you can give her. Don't let her go into these terrible black places. Say, so come here and I'll love you. Just think about it. Just think about it. Okay. All right? Thank you. I'm so sorry. Oh, don't be sorry. Don't be sorry, my poor pet. Oh, oh. I wish I'd. I wish I'd been your mum. <laughs> I wish you had as well. I wish you had. You've been my adopted mum. Oh, yes. you've been. oh, that's good. I've got some adopted grandchildren, but I haven't got an adopted daughter. Oh, you can adopt me. I'll adopt you. <laughs> <laughs> there comes a time in your life when you have to deal with things. You know, you have to choose whether you're going to run and hide forever or whether you're going to just, you know, take the bull by the horns and, and uh, wrestle it to the ground. Unconditional surrender to the life has allowed Debbie the freedom to explore her deepest self. Many aspects of convent life are provoking all the women to challenge themselves, whether they like it or not. For soul singer Iona, it's the silence. This evangelical Christian is used to distracting herself with constant singing, but here that is not allowed. Exasperated, she goes to see the abbess. Has it been tough? Really tough, yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, because bits are painful, um, which is fine. Um, and obviously, you know, stuff's coming up because I'm in this environment, which is great. Yeah. But, um, I suppose I'm, I'm not quite sure where I'm to find my peace in it, but I'm just... You're feeling frustrated, really? Yeah, I'm yeah, yeah, very frustrated and gagged. Because actually, this way of life is tough. You come face to face with yourself, mm. as you really are, yeah. warts and all, and you have to cope with it. Mm. And you see, that's where the... The element of sacrifice comes in. You offer all that to the Lord. Mm. But yeah. I wouldn't like you to waste these next three weeks yeah. Yeah, by not exactly. living the life as fully as you can. Yeah, I agree. Because I think the fact that you've come to this state where, <gasps> where am I going from here? God must have a, a purpose in it. Yeah, possibly. <laughs> He'll make a purpose out of it if he didn't originally have one. <laughs> well, let's leave things as yeah. they are at the moment, and I'll get back to you. Cool. If there's anything I can give you that would be more comforting. Comforting. <laughs> Where'd it go? It's a blue bottle, okay, and it's rubbish. Why do you thwart me?
so I'm doing really well at being silent on the whole, as you can see. I'm such a quiet, retiring type. I wonder how it is, you know, that they thought that this would be tough for me. <sighs> I'm just not feeling it, you know. One of the most important foundations of convent life is the enclosure. For the nuns, living as a community behind the convent walls, withdrawal from the distraction of modern life allows more time for reflection and a deeper communion with God. But to the uninitiated, this environment with its strict routine and long bouts of silence can feel intensely claustrophobic. I suppose because the escapes are a lot fewer than there are with people normally living a working life. Um, and you can't go out to the theatre or to, to a film, you can't go to the pub, you feel a bit cheesed off, you can't just go out for a drink with a mate. You've got, you're still going to be seeing that person, you, or, or yourself, if it's yourself, you can't get away from yourself. That's, the, that's a really tough one. And when you spend quite a lot of time without talking and you know, trying to be peaceful, not noisy, and do things in a kind of ordered way, all the things in your life, you, you can't hide from them anymore, painful things that you have chosen not to look at because they were too difficult, all sorts of things like that, one's own selfishness and shallowness. All those things, but it's, if you talk about it calmly and it sounds fine, but actually living through it doesn't feel like um, a constructive spiritual enterprise. It feels like disintegration and alienation. It's only really after a bit that you get the hang of it and you think, uh-uh, don't worry, this isn't forever and I will come out into something better. It's a testing process, and the nun's assurance of light at the end of the tunnel is falling on deaf ears. So the women have started to project their frustrations out. I just don't think it's going in the right direction now. I know now how the prayer books work. I can go and say the words. I can do the work. I could keep doing that forever if, if it was required, but it isn't doing what we came in here to do. I mean, I am, I am learning something in myself. I'm You're learning, learning to question. Yeah, and to rebel. And it's like, so we are learning, but we could have learned that if we'd gone into army training camp. Yeah. You know? <laughs> like, but I'm not learning. I'm, I'm not I doing learning, anything I am from learning a God tolerance point of view. because I haven't told one of them to piss off. So I am learning tolerance. Convinced that the nuns have got it all wrong and that they know better, they take their grievances to Sister Felicity. Someone said to me yesterday, what is it in your day that you're looking forward to? <laughs> and all I could think of was actually bed. meals <laughs> on your bed. bed. <laughs> so it seems to me that what you're saying is what you were really, really expecting to do was sort of look in on our life rather than be involved in it. No, well, yeah, no, no, no. I think we appreciated we had to live your life. I don't think I can gain any more from that now. I know what that routine is. I know I could do it if I wanted to do it. I find that 5.45 really difficult because what I do at home is... They haven't got have these, I, I the conviction to, that we have yeah, that holds as as us in up, this life. I I have they have all been forced to, to grapple with their inner demons one way or another. And most of these inner demons, once you start grappling with them, you can't really stop. You can pretend to. They can go back and carry on exactly as they did, but they will never be comfortable again with it. They will have to sort out the things that need sorting out. So, you know, I think, I think it's a very positive thing. Um, that I've been saying but rather than face the truth, the women ask for more time in bed. 
I, I have to agree that I don't think the 545 thing does anybody here any good. No, I'm, I'm all right with it. Mm. Yeah, I, I think, I think you can only speak for yourselves, anyway. All right. I mean, saying three, that, just saying, three of us saying that, that yeah. Yeah. Sorry, Debbie, I can't no, speak for you. That's, that's all right. I mean, I, I've, I have, we've all got very different lifestyles, and my lifestyle is um, uh, not enough hours in a day and a young child, and so I'm used to getting up early and doing a bit of work on the sewing machine. Um, well, I'm used to getting up early, but it doesn't, yeah. it doesn't mean that if you get up at five in the morning and you're still going to prayers at 8.30 at mm. night, that that's the best way to live, does it? No, I, yeah. I am a morning person, but yeah, I, I like morning. Exactly. I don't go in the morning. It might be the Resisting the pressure of the group dynamic, Debbie finds the strength to stand up for herself and go it alone. I really do think it's going to help me a lot if I can just get over my fear of things, which I'm really working on. And a lot of things are clicking, making sense. And I really don't think I, um, I don't think I could have got it anywhere else but here. And I, I think I know why. I think I think I was meant to come here for that. So I do feel that way. I can't help it. So for Debbie and the nuns, the rhythm of monastic life continues whilst the other three just seem to do as they please. she teenagers you know there's a sense in which they won't take responsibility for what they're finding difficult I mean I've had that when I was novice mistress with people in the novitiate being bored because they think they know it all but when people are like that it's a clear indication that they're insecure <clears throat> and that they don't really know it all but they have to be on top of it <clears throat> Um, I think it's all a question of them working their way through the difficulties, really. I think we just have to be there for them and, and sort of do what we can to help. <laughs> energize the group, the nuns have invited the woman to a gathering to ask anything they like. Okay. Anybody who wants to ask a question? Anybody who's got a question. What do you wear underneath your habits? <laughs> I've just wondered for weeks. <laughs> oh! <laughs> <laughs> oh <laughs> Debbie, it reminds me, a little five-year-old said to me, when you were a baby nun, did your mummy change your nappies? <laughs> baby nun. But things take a more thought-provoking turn when Victoria starts to question some of the tenets of Catholicism. Because I see a world full of religious divisions at the moment, and those divisions are growing. And then we've got a multisexual culture beginning now as well. I think that we are now seeing many different types of families emerging um, and many different types of unions emerging. And I can see what it says in the Bible, but the Bible was written a very, very, very long time ago when maybe there was less understanding. Yet it's one of those places where people would maybe be excluded from a spiritual nourishing community because of feeling excluded on the basis of their sexuality or their... That's very true. That's yeah. very relevant. At the Last Supper, he prayed that we might all be one. That was one of his deepest prayers, 
as, as he and the father are one. So he wanted all of us to be one. And we struggle for it. Do you think there's hope then for your church to reach the level of acceptance that is part of that kind of love of people? Well, speaking of the church as an institution. Yeah, I am. The thing is that. This, now I, I am. In, um, in one way, the church is an institution, but the church actually is the people who are its members. Yeah. So it's going to be a, a varied answer. I mean, yes. The I feel like the journeying now that I'm going to do it is on my own. You know, yeah, it, it is helping me come up, with, you know, face to face with myself and work through that kind of stuff. But I'm having to do it while physically feeling like I'm holding off their religion. So I'm kind of going, okay, I want to bring it in to my heart, but I need to hold you off. And they see that as my resistance to letting God in. And it's not my resistance to letting God in, it's my resistance to letting their religion in and taking it as my own. How can the churches and because you are part of the Catholic Church, you can only answer... While Victoria I finds organised religion restrictive, for Angela, there's an appeal she can't quite put her finger on. The one thing that makes me continue to, to try to be open about the faith aspect of things is you can't get away from the fact that they all have this light in them. All the nuns, they just... There is something about what this life does for them that you want you really want to find out what it is what is it that lights them up you know <laughs> that's the sort of thing we would say yeah. <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> The nuns believe that surrender to the rules of poverty, obedience and silence is the route to real freedom. But the message is slow to reach Iona. Don't want to be told what to do today. I think one of the nuns is trying to run away from me because I think that I'm disturbing the peace. I just think that I am tired of being what the nuns have given their lives for. I am not this. Oh. Look, I love God desperately, but this institution is so not me. What they're trying to enable you to do is to... Um, the science thing is great, babes. I get focus. the science thing, but no, it's, it's not, not... I don't need it all just the time. About, I don't need... Here. It's not just about si oh, silence. Attached to a tree. It's not just about silence here. Yeah. It's silence there <clears throat> and silence here. Yeah. And, you know, I'm like you. I'm an, all I'm the time? Noisy, I'm a noisy blonde person, you know, loud and, and life and soul of the party. And... It gives me something to to focus on, and when you focus on something, you free up a bit of your your head, believe it or not. I mean, that sort of. I mean, I my my day is like I'm yours. I don't have any two I'm days. I'm in a convent. What the hell am I thinking? What am I here? <laughs> I mean, oh my goodness! <laughs> Why but would I <laughs> ever want to be silent? No, you need to. Um, what? Smash things. Find something else to focus on. It was sex and celibacy that brought Iona to the convent, but her time here is raising far more fundamental questions. Oh, everything. I suppose people said, you know, oh, you'll be really challenged by this, and I was like, yeah, whatever. <laughs> you know, all there'll be challenges, you know, either I'm celibate or I'm not. I didn't think it, the stuff would actually be kind of like me. I'd be challenged. I suppose I just expect things to be easy, and if they're not easy, then I give up. In a way, you know. Just in this setting, it means that I am <laughs> very constrained. Convinced her noisy exuberance masks deeper insecurities, Iona's mentor, Sister Elred, 
encourages her to reach for a deeper level of honesty. By way of example, Sister Elred demonstrates just how honest you can be when you're at peace with yourself. I almost feel like I've I planned my life in a certain way for such a long time, and I thought it was going to be a certain thing. And now that it's not, I don't know how... Not the whole no-sex thing, that's, that's not an issue. It's, it's the... Um, mm, well, it is an issue, but it's, it's not an issue that I'm going to go and run around and sleep with somebody no, that's not it's my... it's an issue. Thing. That's, everybody in some way, that's an issue, yeah. isn't it? Even for nuns. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> How do you handle that? By the way? Well, it's all right when you're 62. When, <laughs> when did you come here? Hardly. 18. Wow. Came straight from school. But it wasn't an issue then. Really? When was it an issue? Well, it was, it was an issue all through my 20s, but in a kind of a, a low-key kind of a way. Okay. But um, when I was 31, I fell in love with somebody. Wow. Like, still within the convent. And then it became a... I had never, could never have conceived that it was possible to want something so much. Yeah. It really blew my mind, yeah. and it made all the rest seem like rubbish. All yeah. the things that Completely. had been so dear to me. Yeah. So I do understand a bit. It certainly was one of the, the greatest gifts I've ever had. And he was married. Had he not been married, I think I would have left. And I think it would have been a terrible mistake, because we had nothing in common really. I remember one day when. Was in the throes of being like really desperate, angry. We had a farm, the community I was in, and one of my jobs would be to go and bring the cows in. And there was this big, big field, and it looked out to sea, the most beautiful place. And when I got out into the field, far from anybody being able to hear me, because it was really quite a deserted place, walking in behind these cows, I shouted at God. And I said to him, you've tricked me. I would never, never have done this if I'd known what it was like to be in love with somebody. I would never have come to be a poor Claire. I didn't know. I wouldn't. This is, I, I'm so angry with you. And just had a total sense, a sense of amusement. I was answered, not in words and not, didn't see anything but a tremendous sense of being answered, A, by a sense of great amusement, tender amusement, loving amusement, not, not scoffing. And s at some level, reassurance that there would be light at the end of the tunnel and it was worth hanging in there. And I, I hung on to that and it was true. I think it's really good to be angry with God and to shout at him sometimes because he loves the truth. It's just to tell polite lies, I think. But it's scary too because at that time just nothing made any sense anymore. Every nun has her own challenges to overcome. For a poor Claire, sacrifice is an essential part of the journey. And for them, this is a small price to pay for the ultimate reward. Sometimes when I'm in the garden, I think nothing could add. You feel so at one with everything and so deeply peaceful that you can't think of what could be added to it. The only thing that could be added to it would be to know that everybody else could feel the same in their own lives. Because I feel there's nothing lacking to me, you know, when I feel like that. In light of Sister Elred's shared honesty and wisdom, Iona begins to realize that embracing the life completely can be more liberating than oppressive. Coming here, it's quite a safe environment, so I was able to feel quite exposed. And I feel like I've taken down my armor. Because uh, in London, I go around kind of like boxer, you know? Um, because I'm so independent, because I'm so by myself, really. Um, so coming here, it blows me away, just the amount of love there is here and how accepted I feel. The most reluctant to let her guard down is Angela. 
she spent the last hour in a prayer hut with Victoria, <laughs> getting drunk. It's the transformation. The nuns have encouraged her to face her fears, but Angela, too willingly distracted, pours her energy into her friendship instead. She's almost sort of like my partner, and Vic's very anti-Catholicism, um, and I value my friendship with her. So it's so hard, isn't it, to know which is the right path to take. It really is. You do have to have a leap of faith. Um, but the problem with that is there's a huge risk involved because it totally challenges how you think. I can't be that logical, sensible, organised together sort of mind. I'm afraid of, of changing myself to a certain degree. I do love things that are tangible. Faith is difficult for me because it's not tangible. Concerned that Angela's focus is still confused by Victoria's influence, her mentor, Sister Gabriel, uses one of the religious lessons to challenge her to make fundamental choices for herself. So we must decide actually whether Jesus really is God in human form because I don't think we can sit on the fence. Um, sometimes we'd like to defer our decision, um, withhold judgment, that we must choose. Um, I think that we must choose to decide because I think if we don't choose, then somehow we can't move on. Can we not learn from the way that he lived his life and tried to encourage other people to live? Can we not learn from that anyway? I mean, if that's what you think, and if yeah. that's what you want to do, that's fine, that's for you to do that. But what other people do in their journey is up to them. I mean, it's not just about um, Angela about Jesus do you know what I mean you could take it for everything really you know to just say well I'm not going to make a choice it's like well I'm just going to ride the rest of my time or well the thing is it's come this far and, you know what's I, happened I, I, but you know I'm just like yeah, it, it, mm. with all respect it is very hard for some of us you yes. know, to, for, for any of it to to make a huge change. The instruction we're getting from yourselves is from one point of view, which is, you know, you are yeah. huge believers in the Catholic mm -hmm. way of life. Well, Angela, I think that always, and I don't mean this in a disrespectful way, but whatever we do, and um, you know, in whatever space we create, and however the timetable is, nothing's perfect. No. Um, no, it doesn't. It's just that I can't... I mean, uh, that's an answer to your question, really. Um. There's this tremendous resistance, and yet there's such a desire to embrace something else. But it's just... It's a battle. But she has to fight. I just came to see if you were all right. Yeah, I'll let you know. Sister Gabriel hopes that, in private, Angela might be more honest with herself. I can't ask the things that I want to ask right. because sometimes it comes out quite abruptly and I know that that upsets you. And I don't want to upset you in front of the others because you're my mentor. I love the way you can 
talk at length on what I think and what I feel <laughs> and how I am. Oh, no. And uh, I instead of telling me about what you think and what you feel mm. and how you are. Because if you concentrate Sometimes on other can... people, yeah. you can avoid yourself. Right. Oh, thank you so much. You know, the thing is sometimes we've got to create a space in order to look at ourselves. And we can get easily distracted because we don't want to look at it. And we'll distract it with people, with a best friend that we've made, with uh, a job that we want to do, uh, or uh, spending time on how we're going to look tomorrow, which are all valid, important, worthwhile things, but ultimately we've got to make the choice of what is the most important thing. Are you okay? Yeah, fine. <laughs> Stay with how you feel. You know, our feelings tell us a lot. Mm. And don't just push them down. Stay with them. No, but I can't see this. If I stayed with it, all I'd do is cry for about an hour. And I can't see that crying for an hour does anybody any good. Well, it might do anybody any good, but it might do you a heck of a lot of good. I mean, Debbie, seems, it... Debbie seems to have been crying ever since she got here, and I can't see that it's done her any good whatsoever. She's still crying. Yeah. Well, I can't speak for Debbie. Only Debbie can speak for herself. And you know, the thing is, Angela, you came here to be with us. Whatever happens outside and whatever friendships you make, they will carry on and be fruitful and wonderful. But this is for us now, and it's to engage with that. And I think that's the most important thing. Living an enclosed life, the poor Clares are allowed just a few visits a year. They are rare and precious occasions. Their guests are restricted to one room in the convent, outside the enclosure. As the four women have tried to live like nuns for the last 26 days, the abbess has granted them the privilege of a visit from home too. But for the women, it provokes mixed feelings. <laughs> Sounds ungrateful, but it's like an interruption almost. I know that I'll cry. You know, and I go through every day trying to avoid having a crying session, so... So it's almost an ordeal. Debbie's visitor is her husband, Ronnie. He's not the same person without me. I'm not the same person without him. He said to me that he can't be everything um, that he wants to be without me being there with him. Do you want to take me home with you? <laughs> and I'm the same as well. As much as you learn to do things and think for yourself and cope for yourself in here, it's great. But when you've had 10 years with somebody and it's been really intense, you can't completely get rid of that. I can, you know, I, I can stand it for a short while. But so you've got to be, you, I mean, there's no way about it. You've got to be absolutely dedicated. Angela's guests are her mum and dad, Joan and Ivan. So what do you consider yourself to be from a faith point of view then? I used to go to church three times a day when I... You know, on a Sunday. I didn't was, know that, you said. Oh, yeah. yeah. I didn't think you'd ever Morning, been to Morning, afternoon and night. Yes, you to sing for the choir. You were singing the choir. Did you? Yes. <laughs> but they threw him out. It was that bad. No. I, I <laughs> couldn't, tease it. I couldn't sing, no. That's <laughs> definite. But you see, I thought you'd had no religious exposure oh, at no. all. Oh, yeah. there you are, you see. I've been in... You never attempt to hear what we're talking about. That's the problem. Angela's parents drove 500 miles today just to spend a few hours with her. I always thought that I'd been a disappointment to my parents. 
But everybody said to me that they can see that they're proud of me. Just for who I am. Thank you. Last to arrive is Iona's older brother, Andrew. Oh, hello. hello. Oh, thank you. As he introduced her to religion in the first place, his reassurance could help Iona finally accept the discipline and focus on what is beyond it. It is so strange. It is the absolutely weirdest thing in the whole world. Oh, right. Because it's so not me. Oh. I have been going mad. Mm. <laughs> the sincerity is scaring me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I want to be on the outside. Like, I, everything, everything happens in here. They don't leave. And they're silent. Oh, that was great. <laughs> that was great. Andrew, they're silent I mean, most of the time. Think, yeah, you, I know, this is really important. This is contemplative. This is really important for you, and you know it is. Why is this really important for me? Because you know full well you've been brought here. OK, like, talk so much Teresa. stuff. Oh, okay. No, don't talk to me. OK, 5 a.m. No, 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 you brought me now. <laughs> <laughs> so annoying. So 5.45, the first service of the day. Then a break for Bible reading after that, for an hour and a half. Mm -hmm. Then another service at 7.35. So that's the second <laughs> service I do. Before nine, I like it. Shut up. At 8.30, <laughs> okay, half an hour for breakfast. Right. 8.30, the third service, which is mass. Ooh. It's so boring. Do, no, don't, it's not about Andy. being good, it's about learning, you see. Learn what you've got. If you're, you, okay, automatically, you, you, I'm enormously excited because you're actually able to get up at, uh, before you know, midday and stuff. That's great. <clears throat> I believe that you have to um, shut up. <laughs> <laughs> shut up. Excellent. Okay, and the shut things up. you don't like the most, the things you need to do more. You're not giving me anything I need right now. I'm giving you everything you need, that's the problem. You're so annoying. Honestly, sis, if this has been done for hundreds of years, chances are there might be some meaning to it. I know that, I know that. That evening, reflecting on Andrew's visit and still touched by the honesty and love of Sister Elred's advice, Iona decides to go back and see the abbess. Sister Elred, I wanted to come and apologize. I kind of wanted to say, you know, it, to me, I, I want to grow. I don't want to just tread water. I don't want to just be doing it in order that I get out quicker. No. For us, it's this idea of committing our day to the Lord in, in a wholehearted manner. Yeah. And when, the, when you see the sun rising mm. and you see these beautiful sights and the sort of the air hasn't had a chance to get polluted or the day, it, it's something so magnificent that it'd be very sad if you mm. missed out. Yeah. Anyway, thank you for saying thank that. Because actually it's a great help when people come along like you just and say, I'm sorry, because you can start again. Mm, yeah. You know, that whatever the, you know, whatever happens, to say you're sorry puts everything right. Mm. And, and I think that's important. Yeah. I so thank you. Quite, quite right about it. I felt no, but that thank you. Like, I'm so sorry. I felt ridiculous yes. immediately after that. I don't know what was that. Having spent the last 29 days fighting against the disciplined life, Iona finally surrenders herself to it. Freely choosing the path of obedience has opened her eyes to the fundamental value that lies at its heart. 
which is simply love. So few people give anything, you know. And like, I'm not used, I think, to being given to, you know. I'm really good at giving, <laughs> just not very used to receiving with kind of love, you know, other than kind of from people who have to love my family. <laughs> but to see it, you know, oh, wow, that just blew me away. And it's just, I think it's changing what I expect, you know, from relationships and from, I think especially from male relationships, even though there aren't many men here, it's like, um, I just expected so little. And seeing how I'm meant to relate to people and the way that people, especially men, are meant to, meant to relate to me and meant to treat me, I think it's all wrapped up in the same thing, you know? I don't know. <laughs> yeah, so it's been a really good day. <laughs> really hard, <laughs> really hard day, but yeah. I get to sing to my Lord, and he gets to just smile over me and lean into me. <laughs> Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that had saved a wretch like me I was, was lost But now, Lord, I am found I was blind but now I Next week on The Convent, the culmination of 40 days and 40 nights of routine, ritual and contemplation reaches its end. Profound truths are hitting home for some. It has, without a doubt, given me a sense of self-worth. I have to say that. Whilst others reach crunch point. Have you got any dry white wine? <laughs> so after all the sacrifices made... It certainly cost a lot cost a lot more than I think we ever dreamed. Mm. Will this journey prove worthwhile for everyone? If you've been affected by any of the issues in tonight's programme and would like to talk to someone in confidence, please call the BBC Action Line on 08000 688 456. All calls are free and confidential. Lines are open every day from 7.30am until midnight.